Welcome to the America's 360 podcast. Get the inside scoop and the outside perspective on the latest developments from Canada, Latin America, and everywhere in between. America's 360 is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Hello and welcome to a special presentation of America's 360. I'm John Molesky. Columbia's president, Yvonne Duque, recently visited the Wilson Center. He held a discussion with the Wilson Center's president, director, and CEO, Ambassador Mark Green, and also with the director of the Center's Latin American program, Cindy Arntzen, who, as you know, is also a member of the America's 360 Roundtable. We hope you enjoy this discussion and that you'll join us again soon for another edition of America's 360. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm director of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center. And it is a pleasure and an honor to welcome President Juan Duque of Colombia back to the Wilson Center. This is one of our very first public as well as virtual events since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic um, some 18 months ago. So it's especially gratifying to welcome President Duque uh, as one of our first in-person guests as we try to get back to some semblance of normality in the workplace. I want to extend a warm welcome to members of President Duque's family and distinguished members of his administration who are with us here today, the President's Chief of Staff, Maria Paula Correa, the Minister of Trade, Maria Jimena eh, Lombana, the Minister of Environment, Carlos Correa, who is joining us once again, um, the President of the Colombian Senate, Juan Diego Gomez, and of course, our dear friend, um, Juan Carlos Pinzon, Colombia's distinguished ambassador to the United States. I believe Carlos Vecchio, the Venezuelan ambassador uh, to the United States, is also joining us for today's gathering. Colombia and the U.S.-Colombian relationship have been central to the work of the Latin American program for decades, and this focus will continue as Colombia works to accelerate its economic recovery, overcome the effects of the pandemic, and also as the country holds presidential elections next year. It is also a distinct honor to introduce and welcome Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, a former vice presidential candidate, and one of Latin America's staunchest champions in the U.S. Senate. Um, Senator Kane is a member of the Foreign Relations Committee and is chair of its subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. And in his official duties, um, he brings a unique sensitivity to the region's challenges. Because just after graduating college and long before his entry into electoral politics, a young Tim Kaine ran a technical school founded by Jesuit missionaries in Honduras, where he trained teenagers to become carpenters and welders. And this vision of service, uh, this vision of the needs of developing countries, of the importance of creating opportunities for productive work, have continued to inform Senator uh, Kane's professional career. I also um, would like to note that he is one of the few members of either House of Congress who is not of Hispanic or Latino origin to speak fluent Spanish. So it's really a a pleasure to have you here. I'm also delighted to introduce or to reintroduce to all of you Ambassador Mark Green, who took over as president, uh, CEO, and director of the Wilson Center last March. Mark also has a long and distinguished career in public service. He is a former member of Congress from Wisconsin, a former administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, a former U.S. ambassador to Tanzania, and former director of the McCain Institute, as well as a former Peace Corps volunteer. So having grown up part of his life in South Africa, he also brings a special sensitivity to the challenges of developing nations. And while he was at USAID, as I am sure he will uh, discuss later, he made several trips to the Colombian-Venezuelan border, an experience that deepened his commitment to the issues of refugees and human displacement, which is the subject of today's discussion. Senator Kane, welcome again to the Wilson Center. 
please join us on the podium. Well, what a, what a treat it is to be back together with you at the Wilson Center. Dr. Arnson, thank you for your kind words, and I'm particularly glad to be here for the visit of President Duque. When I was asked by Ambassador Pinzon whether I might offer a few words, I accepted because I would, I'm glad to offer the few words, but I really want to listen to this president so that we can determine how best to continue to deepen the U.S.-Columbia relationship. I appreciate Cindy commenting upon my passion for the Americas. Uh, that was inspired more than 40 years ago as a young kid. I was teaching Hondurans to be carpenters and welders. And after grappling through the fog of not really understanding the language to a point where I could charlar bastante bien con los jóvenes, I realized how connected we are. And that just uh, feeling of connection at the uh, Corazón de Alma uh, has really inspired much of my work in the years since. Um, I'm here because the U.S.-Colombia relationship is incredibly important. And it's a relationship that has deepened over the last decades in Democratic and Republican administrations. Um, President Duque and I were talking about whether it was President Clinton or President Bush, President Obama or President Trump, and now President Biden. This is a relationship that means a lot to the United States. And we're very, very proud of the accomplishments in Colombia in recent decades. We're engaging in some real soul searching in the United States right now, as Ambassador Green knows, about what might we hope to accomplish with our humanitarian desires for other nations and the questions, hard questions we're having to ask ourselves about Afghanistan uh, have led to some real skeptics about what America can uh, accomplish or help accomplish in other parts of the world. Uh, to those skeptics, there's reasons to be skeptical and there's reasons to ask hard questions. But I do think the U.S.-Columbia relationship, a bipartisan one in recent years, points the direction uh, to how the U.S. can engage in a humanitarian way uh, with a partner and then celebrate that partner's successes. I do believe, and I was with President Duque recently in Colombia with five other senators, three Democrats and three Republicans, and we talked at length about the challenges of the last 18 months. Um, I think the pandemic might have had more of a challenge for Colombia than virtually any nation on the planet because it was a health emergency in Colombia just as it was in the United States, because it was an economic challenge for Colombia just as it was in the United States. But Colombia has two additional challenges that we're not grappling with to the degree, and you really can't understand the magnitude of the challenge without thinking of these. Colombia has been dealing with the pandemic and the economic devastation that, that it has led to, while also dealing with this sizable tsunami of refugees from Venezuela. The per capita number of refugees to Colombia as compared to the challenges that we face with own refugee and migrant populations in the United States. Every time I go to Com Colombia and I visit the border in Cucuta, I'm just really struck by the generosity of Colombian people and Colombian leaders. And I also remember the first time I went to Cucuta and I stood on the bridge that comes across the river that's now closed. The first sign you see as you come across a bridge from Venezuela into Colombia pre-pandemic was a hand-lettered sign that said vacuna with a line pointing unva unvaccinated Venezuelans to the public health service right at the border where they could get the vaccines that they need. Um, in addition, if the refugee issue wasn't enough, uh, Colombia has also been in the midst of a very far-reaching effort to find peace and reinvest in parts of the nation that were disinvested in for decades during the Civil War. You can only invest, and I've talked about this with President Duque numerous times, how important it is to do those investments and to connect the country, but you can only do those if you have economic resources. And when times are tough economically, as they are in the pandemic, it makes it much harder to do that. And, and people who have had pent up desire to see investments in parts of their country, uh, it's hard to look at them and say, it'll be a little bit longer. So I have great respect for the work that uh, President Duque does. And the relationship needs to continue to deepen. And that's what I urge on President Biden and his team all the time. In fact, I was just on the phone with Secretary Blinken about it a few minutes before I arrived. The second reason I'm here is this. The United States does not pay enough attention to Latin America. The United States does not pay enough attention to the Caribbean. And this has been a criticism that I've had about the United States ever, ever since I lived in Honduras in 1980 and 81. We often pay attention to the Americas if there's a crisis that lands on our doorstep, like a migration crisis or a, or a narcotics crisis. But if the crisis abates, we immediately turn and look elsewhere. 
Um, often our secretaries of state act as if there's only an east-west axis in the world and not a north-south axis. But in the many challenges that we're dealing with today, from the pandemic to the rise of China, I think the path forward for the United States is to build a coalition of equals from Yukon to Patagonia, and to begin as we do that with the nations with whom we already have very strong relationships. And I know President Duque is a visionary leader who would like to see that happen as well. Talk about a visionary leader. Um, he's doing something that a lot of our officials aren't doing, expressing a public willingness to accept Afghan refugees in Colombia. We've done that in Virginia, but not all states are doing it so willingly. So I'm anxious to hear what President Tuque has today. I consider him a friend, and I want to do all I can as the chair in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee of the America Subcommittee to deepen this relationship um, and encourage a Biden administration to be as forward-leaning in our ties with the Americas as any uh, administration in the last half century. I look forward to hearing you, Mr. President, and thanks to the Wilson Center for doing this event today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Green, president of the Wilson Center. Thank you, Senator Kane. It's always great to have you here to be with you and to listen uh, to your vision for leadership in the Americas. I wholeheartedly agree. Dr. Aronson, thank you, and thanks for your great work. And thanks to everyone for uh, being here today. Welcome to this special event, Humanity in Motion, a conversation with Ivan Duque, president of Colombia. So I first met Ivan Duque uh, when he was president-elect and I was administrator of USAID. It was backstage at the Concordia Summit in Bogota. I remember asking about his plans for Colombia and his hardworking people. They were big plans, from extending economic hope to areas too often left behind, to reforming the tax system to make it more competitive and to spur economic growth and investment, to making higher education more accessible for a restless young generation. So little did I know then that I would visit Colombia five times as administrator, in fact, more than any other country during my tenure. Little did he know then that while he would stay true to chasing those big plans, uh, there would be a few crises and tests along the way. He inherited a peace accord built on hope, but one which in some communities also planted some seeds of resentment. And then came COVID-19. I agree with the Senator. Uh, Colombia and her neighbors hit especially hard. Uh, if that weren't enough, Colombia bore the brunt of the largest mass migration event in the history of the Americas. In the last few years, some 5.4 million Venezuelans have fled Maduro's brutal regime, the largest number into Colombia, and many of them still there. Colombians are a generous people, and they recall those days when they were the ones on the move and in flight. Even so, there is unmistakably a burden on public services and a loss on economic activity. There is an unmistakable impact. Mr. President, one of history's little lessons is that God laughs at every leader. Every new president is quite certain what they will prioritize and what they will work on. But tests and crises tend to rear their ugly head and put some challenges in that path. Natural disasters, man-made disasters. I know some might wonder what might have been, what your leadership could have achieved had these challenges not erupted. But others, no doubt, are grateful that yours was the steady hand leading Colombia during these important times and these challenging times. Today's event is entitled Humanity in Motion, not merely to reflect the waves of poor Venezuelans who have fled into Colombia, but also, Mr. President, to recognize your leadership as they have fled from their homes. When Congress created the Wilson Center more than 50 years ago, their legislation directed us to strengthen the relationship between the world of learning and the world of public policy. We're dedicated to knowledge, we're dedicated to history's lessons, and I know, we all know, that there's much we can learn from Columbia's experiences. 
Earlier this year, President Duque took the historic step of granting more than a million Venezuelans temporary protection status, a move the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees called the most important humanitarian gesture in the region in decades. This enables those poor Venezuelans to work legally, to get access to health and education services. It makes them just a little bit less vulnerable to those who might exploit them or prey upon them. Uh, but TPS is not a magic wand. It does not make the migrants' challenges go away or Colombia's challenges go away. Even though the surge of migrants from Venezuela was a crisis not of Colombia's making, and even though Colombia's <coughs> TPS decision has been heralded in capitals all around the world, it's also true that except for the U.S., the needs of both these migrants and the communities that host them have been badly underfunded by the donor community or ignored altogether. A fraction, for example, of the funds that have been set aside for Syria and Sudan, shameful and wrong. I visited Kukata several times. I've seen firsthand the suffering of those displaced and the generosity of the Colombians who are doing their best to help. It is time for the U.S. to call a new donor conference and make a renewed effort to get other nations to do their part as well. As Senator Kane noted, uh, we should also see that even with all of these costs and challenges which uh, he has eloquently laid out, President Duque and his government have shown leadership and generosity once again for those in need, even from other regions of the world. President Duque has said that Colombia will temporarily accept some 4,000 Afghans who have fled the Taliban. Once again, the world of learning lessons that perhaps we can take to heart. Next year, the United States and Colombia will celebrate the 200th anniversary of official bilateral relations. But it's not just bilateral relations, it is deep friendship. Mr. President, you are America's friend at a time when friendships and alliances matter. We are with you, we are with your leadership, and we are delighted to have you here today and to hear from you here today. Mr. President, welcome to the Wilson Center. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be again here at the Wilson Center. Senator Kane, thank you so much for your kind words. It's always with friendship and admiration that I welcome your presence. And I also want to thank you for your visit to Colombia, where your leadership allowed us to have such an important delegation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Green. It's great to, to be again here at the Center. And it's also great to see you because we know how much you've done for our country and we value all your initiatives that made an impact on the lives of thousands of Colombians. Thank you, Cindy, again. We've been uh, friends for many, many years and it's great to be back at the center and to be here discussing about things that we've done in Colombia and also the road for the country. I also wanna express my gratitude to Ambassador Pinzon and uh, also to the president of the Colombian Congress, Juan Diego Gomez, who's here, my chief of staff, Maria Paula Correa, Minister Lombana, Minister Carlos Correa from Environment. I want to express my gratitude to Eddie Acevedo. Thank you uh, so much, Eddie. It's great to see you again. Um, my um, best uh, regards to Alex Valderrama, Charles Cobb, Jorge Wildenberg, J.B. Simcoe, Kenneth Slatter, Jackie Slatter, Kenneth Slatter. Thank you so much for joining us today. Eric, it's great to see you. Um, I also want to express that it's great to be back in Washington. I lived here for 14 years, and it's great to be in a great moment where we should be participating tomorrow in the United Nations General Assembly. I was thinking about how to approach this conversation and this my brief remarks so that we can have a, a good uh, Q&A session. And I just wanted to mention that three years ago, I visited the center and I said what the vision that we had for Colombia was. We're talking about three concepts, the rule of law, 
we call it legalidad, the entrepreneurial spirit, emprendimiento, and why the way we connected both should lead us to have equidad, which is a good way to say how do we close the gaps. In three years, many things have happened. And even though we have been facing a very complicated moments of a COVID-19 pandemic, what's interesting is that we've never lost focus on what we wanted to achieve for the Colombian people. In three years, we said that it was our duty, our moral duty, to face narco-trafficking, to be able to fight all forms of corruption, and at the same time, to be able to make the right denouncements in the international community so that dictatorships like the one that has been ruling Venezuela could have all the diplomatic pressure to start making a change. In legality, in these three years, and great to see you, Dr. Samper, again, in these uh, this three years in legality, we have been able to achieve the lowest homicides rates in almost four decades. In 2019, we had the fourth, third lowest homicide rate in Colombia, and last year, the lowest in 46 years. And that demonstrates that when you have the combination of social investment and the rule of law throughout the country, you can make big changes. We've also fought narco-trafficking because narco-trafficking is the enemy of peace in a country like Colombia. And we not only achieved last year 130,000 hectares that were manually eradicated, but we also last year were able to demonstrate that we can have the largest amount of interdictions in our history, interdicting more than 500 tons of cocaine. And we have registered the highest number in the interdiction participation in the Americas, representing almost 50% of all the drugs that are interdicted and that is saving lives in the United States streets. But also, we had the largest destruction on labs. And we decided that if we were going to make this fight successful, we had it to make a big investment in terms of peace with legality. And three years have passed. Many people, for political reasons, just, just want to say nothing has been done. But then I always think on this great phrase of Daniel Patrick Moynihan here at the United States, where he says, in politics, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. So when it's about facts, we have demonstrated that we have been able to have massive land titling. And I have to thank you for that. Mark, because when you were a USAID, we made the largest massive distribution of land titles. And by December this year, we're going to grant 50,000 titles of property ownership throughout the country. And this is in just three years and a half. And this is surpassing what was done eight years before, where there were 35,000 titles, or even in the previous eight years where there were 25,000. So it, it had a lot of, of political willingness and this is changing the lives of many people. We decided to put forward a national cadaster, a multi-purpose cadaster, in order to embrace the regional focus development plans. And that's also taking place in a, in a rapid way in the country. And I could mention more details, but I think in, 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 in essence, what we're doing in terms of legality and building peace with legality is that the values of truth, justice, reparation, and non-repetition can really be generating confidence throughout the country. The second thing that I also mentioned when, when, when it comes to, to legality is that we have fought corruption like no other time before. We passed legislation in order to make public all the income tax declarations from high officers, also to make public all the conflicts of interest. And when people are uh, sanctioned for crimes that represent crimes against the state that are pure corruption, there's no longer a, what we called residential prison or imprisonment. They have to be in jail. And we're now promoting a bill that has been discussed in Congress so that we can lift the, the corporate veil of corporations. And if there are companies that have been involved in corruption, we not only lift the corporate veil, but we go against those who make the decisions. So this is happening. 
And at the same time, we decided that for the sake of legality, we should retire ourselves from UNASUR and we should denounce Nicolas Maduro before the International Criminal Court. Nicolas Maduro, in my opinion, is the equivalent of Aslodovan Milosevic in Latin America. This is a brutal dictator. This is a guy who every single day brutalizes its people, and he has destroyed all elements of independence in institutions. So we denounced, and we have supported the Venezuelan uh, communities. And we have decided to make a very bold move based on principles, which is to embrace the 1.8 million brothers and sisters that have left Venezuela with frozen bones, with a, lacking the access to many services, and be able to say, even though we're not a rich country, it is our moral duty to allow them to have access to opportunities in Colombia. With the, my team in the presidency, with Maria Paula Correa and the director of migration, eh, Juan Francisco Espinosa, and many other agencies, we thought this was going to be more complicated. USAID gave us a lot of support. So did Filippo Grandi and some other agencies. And as of today, we have more than 1.3 million Venezuelans that are already registered with biometrical recognition, and they will have their card in the next months. And that makes a difference. And that's also based in legality. When we talk about how we connect this with entrepreneurship, we have to be very much convinced that private initiative makes not only sense to create a better quality of life. Private initiative is the only way a country can make substantial change over time. And I have been a clear advocate of private initiative, but we also started to promote the concept of entrepreneurship thinking on B Corps, benefit corporations that not, not only conceive the role of doing good, but doing well and allowing people in need to have opportunities. We launched the bill for B Corporations this year with the help of Minister Lombana. We're gonna get to 1,000 B Corps registered in Colombia and we'll be the number one country in the world with B companies that are registered. But we are also training 100,000 programmers to have the workforce that will be demanded from the technology sector. We decided to create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. We, we have now more than 20 centers around the country where we have co-working opportunities, training opportunities, and we get the entrepreneurs to connect where their demand is. And we decided to to embrace a fiscal policy where we will reduce the weight of the tax burden on private corporations, and we did it in 2018. Then the Constitutional Court in 2019 said we had to start from scratch, and we did it, and we moved it again. And with that, we ended at 2019 growing above the world average, regional average, OECD average. We also were able to expand tax collections by 10%, and we were able for the first time in almost a decade to register a primary fiscal surplus. That demonstrated that it was the right policy. 2020, the pandemic came. Never, we never anticipated that such a painful moment could uh, happen to the world. And when I look a year and a half backwards, I realize that we all had to face this challenge without a playbook. But we have done something that is resilient enough. We were able to duplicate our ICUs. We were able to massify vaccination. We were able to pay for the first line services and the personnel who saved lives. We were able to create a PPE reserve to protect the people that were deployed throughout the country in the healthcare system. And we also created the strongest social safety net in Colombia's history, where we have been able to provide subsidy of 40 or 50% of the minimum wage to almost 4 million formal workers. And we created a universal income 
for the poorest of the poor, and we have been able to grant non-conditional cash transfers to almost 4 million households, benefiting more than 10 million Colombians. And we also put in place one of my dreams that I had for Colombia, that I shared here at the Wilson Center, that was to have free public university education for the poorest of the poor and the emerging middle class. And we also created a special subsidy focalized on helping the private sector to hire youngsters. So we grant a 25% subsidy equivalent of paying for the social security in order to hire people between 18 and 28. We launched that almost eight weeks ago. And what we have seen is that more than 55,000 Youngsters have been hired because we have this right incentive. So this is something that we want to promote with, promote with enthusiasm. And we have been able to look at the energy transition. Even though we were facing the pandemic, the energy transition has taken place in Colombia. We have been able to expand the highways, the four generation, we're now opening the five generation bits. We're interconnecting the country. More than three million households today have received fast speed internet due to the regulation changes that we empowered in the country. And when it comes, when it comes to equality, closing the gaps, the investment in tertiary roads, the investments in electrification, in water and storage, and also the capacity to connect the local peasants with the people who could buy their products without intermediation has allowed us to put us in the road to be granting 300,000 of those kinds of contractual agriculture by August next year. All this is happening. And this year we demonstrated how resilient we are. We came out from the recession in the first trimester even growing above Mexico or Chile. Second trimester of this year, we grew 17.6%, and that means this is the biggest trimester of this century in terms of growth, and everything is leading us for that. By the end of the year, we will grow above 7%. This demonstrates the strength of Colombia. And yes, do we have challenges? Yes, we do. Do we still have to fight criminals? Yes, we do. Do we still have to do much more to close the social gaps? Yes, we do. But we're doing this with the concept of sustainability. We are going to Glasgow this year with a clear commitment of reducing by 51% our CO2 emissions to 2030, becoming a carbon neutral country in 2050, being the leaders in the energy transition and in clean mobility, embracing the circular economy, protecting the Amazon, protecting the high altitude ecosystems. That is the Colombia that is in place and that is the Colombia that today is visiting this Wilson Center that we consider one of the most important think tanks in Washington, but also one of the most important centers that has analyzed Latin American politics and Latin American policy. So I'm getting very uh, enthusiastic, Mark, and I know we have a, a Q&A session, but let me close saying this. U.S. and Colombia. Next year, we'll be celebrating 200 years of bilateral relationships. When I look at the books of history, we know that Manuel Trujillo y Torres came to Washington and he approached John Quincy Adams, who was the Secretary of State, and he got President Monroe to recognize Colombia in almost uh, uh, 200 years ago. And it was the first recognition of a former Spanish colony and in the Americas. And since then, we have shared values of democracy and liberty. In the last 25 years, the relationship ha has become stronger, bipartisan, bicameral. We see the United States as our now number one ally in the Western Hemisphere, and I know the United States sees us as the one, number one ally in the Western Hemisphere. We want the American people to know and feel in their hearts that what has happened in Colombia in the last 25 years is a good symbol of great dipl dip diplomacy, that what matters is to create 
a sound ecosystem. And the best way to describe it is that 20 years ago in a foreign policy magazine, there was an index about countries that were failed states. And Colombia was not a failed state, but it was on the brink of becoming a failed state. Today, Colombia is a member of the OECD and it's a vibrant, a vibrant economy. And it's a country that is making a lot of social changes, even though we have many, many challenges ahead. So my invitation to all of you is to see this celebration of the 200 years as the opportunity to keep on promoting a friendship and a brotherhood, but at the same time use us as a reference of what, of what can be done in other states when we work together in a bipartisan, bicameral way. Thank you so much, and I'm ready to start the Q&A session. President, again, uh, thank you. It's great to have you here with us. So uh, next month, the Wilson quarterly issue that will come out is a special issue dedicated entirely to human displacement. We have 83, 85 million displaced people around the world. And so um, uh, I would also point out that uh, President Duque is actually one of the authors who's going to contribute to the Wilson quarterly. Without giving away all that you are going to write, uh, as we grapple with displaced communities around the world, uh, what uh, lessons would you offer up from your experience over these last couple of years? What, what lessons do you see for us as we all grapple with humanity in motion? Ambassador Green, I strongly believe that there are many faces to displacement, displacement and and massive uh, migration. Definitely violence is one. And in a country like Colombia, if we want to put an end to that particular uh, situation, we definitely have to look at illegal mining and we have to look at illegal drugs. When Ambassador Pinzon left the Ministry of Defense, uh, Colombia had 50,000 hectares of coca crops. Four years down the road, we were above 200,000, which is more than we had when Plan Colombia started. Is that a failure? No. It is just to know that coca crops is like, and I'm using this uh, parody, is, is it's like poison ivy. If you don't cut it every day, it'll grow back again and it'll grow faster. So we had to recognize that more coca, less peace. More coca, more crime. So that's why we decided to stop that growth and start taking the numbers down, combining many elements. And I have to say that we have to still figured out the core responsibility action plan. Because today, countries like Colombia are also consumers. But nobody has said anything about what happened in 2020, where the consumption of illegal drugs throughout the world, and especially in the higher income countries, uh, had an exponential uh, expansion. So if we want to stop that displacement coming out of that violence, we have to see that as a tool. The second thing is illegal mining, which is also a way to connect uh, the, the, the whole criminal network that we have in Latin America. Maduro provides safe haven to FARC, ELN, Clan del Golfo, you name it, or most of those groups. And they're all connected into the illegal exploitation of, of mines and they brutalize a lot of people. So if we wanna put an end, we also have to denounce this and we have to do something worldwide in order to have a registry of all the yellow machinery that has been moving for this industry because they are not assembled by, by rookies. It takes a long time to assemble in the midst of the Amazon uh, a big uh, yellow machinery equipment. But there's also a, another element, migration that comes out of poverty and authoritarianism. That's the tragedy in Haiti, that's the tragedy also in the southern border of the United States where a lot of people are just wanting to cross and multiply themselves by the exchange rate. So the only way that I see that we can do something to prevent that is to have the 
uh, nearshoring and open opportunities to generate sustainable employment in the Americas. And last but not least, something that is going to happen more frequently is the refugees from climate change. More natural disasters, more destruction, more coastal erosion is going to have more pressure. So we better act boldly and rapidly to protect those areas in the Americas that are under attack by the effects of climate change. And if we don't do something bold and rapid, they're going to be chasing the southern border of the United States or other countries in Latin America to multiply themselves by the exchange rate. Sorry if I took too long to respond to that answer, but I think in the context, those are the three most important pressures on migration and, and also on, on displacement in the region. So you're, you're saying there are many causes and therefore many things we must all work on and attack. So, uh, Dr. Armson. Sure. President Duque, thank you again for your remarks. Colombia, as we know, has presidential elections next year. Um, it's also a country like many in Latin America that has experienced, uh, you know, outbreaks of public protest, um, violence and, and counter-violence um, by state forces. In, re with respect to uh, Venezuelan migrants, public opinion is not exactly favorable. So what do you think will happen to the generosity that you have demonstrated under the next administration, which will take office in August of 2022, and what can you do to solidify uh, the, the legacy of, of these policies of um, temporary protected status? That, that's a great question, Cynthia, and I've been asked that question uh, in the last weeks uh, in many, uh, 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 in many uh, news uh, that have interviewed me. And, I have to say something. People, when they ask me, why did you make that move? And I said, because I promised it. I promised this when I was campaigning. Imagine somebody who's running for the president saying, I'm going to grant a TPS for the Venezuelans in Colombia. So this was not no surprise. I, I promised it. And you know, Mark, that when I came to office, I called other heads of state. We were at the OAS General Assembly in Colombia in 2019, and I launched this. And we were also in Nunga in 2018, and we had a very important uh, side event where we talked about the need to have a way to protect the migrants. So it was being coherent and consistent with what I said. But the other thing is that the Colombian Constitution, Cynthia, has one beautiful article that is Article 100. That article says foreigners in Colombia will have the same rights as Colombians, obviously with the limits that would be established in the law. We also sign an international treaty in 1994 where we grant labor rights to foreigners in Colombia. So this is consistent with, with the legislation and with our constitution. But most importantly, they were already in Colombia. And they were not visible. And what happens when you're not visible is that you don't get to access a bank account. You don't get to buy a house. You don't get to save. And I lived in the United States for 14 years. And I met a lot of the diaspora from my country. And I met people who were legal in the United States. And I met people who were illegal in the United States. And I realized that when somebody enters into a legalization process, they are so motivated that they want to be engines of opportunities. You can't imagine what it means to a migrant to be able to open a bank account. As simple as that. So we had 1.8 million. Obviously, we had around 900,000 people who were already granted with a temporary status. But we decided to grant the TPS for 10 years. And we're going to give them their card by December to 1 million, the next 800,000 in the next semester with biometrical recognition. And it fixes two challenges. One is the security challenge, because if somebody did a wrongdoing and he was captured, then you ask what your name is. And they say, Juan Perez. They take him to the judge. What's your name? Juan Ortiz. But you weren't Juan Perez? You can't prove it. So that's why we, we had a lot of, of, of complexities when there was a, a wrongdoing. And in the other way, 
in another way of seeing it is when people were hired as migrants, a lot of people were hired and they were paid below what the Colombian citizens should be paid. So it distorted the whole uh, labor market. In this way, you play in the field. So everybody has the same rights. And if you do it correctly, you get the people to participate in economic activity. And last but not least, if you had people without recognition and they go to a hospital and they go through the emergency unit where you cannot say no to the service, once they come out, it becomes a rising expensive debt. Now you could have some of the people in the contributionary system and for the health care, and you will have other people for the subsidiary system. So this balances a lot the access to those kind of opportunities. So I just think to myself, who could come to office with the idea that they will do good by destroying such a policy? Who could win? You lose in security, you lose in social policy, you lose in trying to close the gaps, and you will make people invisible, and that could create more uh, despair and more anxiety. So I think this is a policy that was built thinking of the best for the country and the best for the Venezuelan people. And that's why you can count that I will defend it as president and as a former president if needed, because this is the right thing to do and the moral right thing to do. Mr. President, I'm gonna, uh, first off, uh, great, that was very, very helpful. I wanna pick up just quickly on something that you talked about uh, a little earlier on. You spoke eloquently about uh, changing climate and its impacts on migration, but also moves that your government is making to deal with environmental fallout and how that relates to uh, questions of migration in displaced communities. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Because I think that's something that is not well understood. And quite frankly, on the environmental front, I, I'm not sure that people fully uh, uh, appreciate or understand all that your administration has been doing to conserve uh, areas, uh, precious areas. Mark, I'm a, a true convinced of uh, environmentalism as, as a cause. And this is, climate change is the biggest uh, issue of our time. And we just have to act individually and collectively. Things that have happened in these three years when we took office, only 0.2% of our energy matrix was conventional renewables. And now with projects that have already been inaugurated, that are being built and that will be inaugurated in the next 14 months, we're going to pass 2,500 megawatts of installed capacity. And we're having a new bill for 4,800 megawatts. So this makes Colombia the leader of the energy transition in, in the hemisphere, or at least in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Clean mobility. We had an act, and we, and we started giving incentives to start moving to electric vehicles, and we had the plan to get to 6,000 by the end of my term, and we're getting to the 6,000 by the end of this month. So last year, the, the amount of, of sales of, of uh, electric vehicles was 90% above 2019. And this year is going to be almost 200% above 20, 2020. So that process is in, is in the making. And we have now the largest public transportation fleet in electric vehicles and the same in cargo. So the incentives are there. Circular economy, we launched a policy. We enacted the Leticia Pact with other heads of state to protect the Amazon. We subscribed a plan to protect the high altitude ecosystems known as, as Paramos. We're protecting the coral reefs, expanding uh, the national parks and the protected areas. And just to, to say it in a, in a good comparison, the 59 national parks that we have in Colombia are the equivalent of the size of Ecuador. So we're protecting but we have to do much more. We have to reforest. That's why we joined the One Trillion Trees Initiative with the World Economic Forum. And we said that we wanted to meet the target of planting 180 million trees by August 2022. And uh, Minister Correa, every single time I see him, I, he knows I'm asking how many trees today. And he knows that we're going to get to 120 million by the end of the year. And this is a commitment. But I made, I made a comment this morning in a, in a closed meeting that we had with other heads of state looking towards Glasgow. 
I have two major concerns. One is that the pandemic is not over. And many countries have to keep on spending uh, to protect the poorest of the poor, protecting the social safety net, and trying to close the social gap. And at the same time, we all have to do investments to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And everybody is indebted, the fiscal deficits are high, and the rating agencies are evaluating emerging markets with pandemic eyes. So with the level of, of debt that you have, uh, I just want to know who's going to pay for this, because you need to have a private sector effort, but you need to have the public sector doing the same thing. So it brings me to a proposal that I want to drop here in the conversation, and I will be uh, talking about this in the UN General Assemblies. We need to have the IMF working with emerging economies so that every structural investment on climate action and energy transition should be considered out of the average fiscal deficit analysis. As we have done it in the past with infrastructure in some countries, this is a way so that we can all accelerate the path of carbon neutrality. Colombia is playing a very important role. And we have to think on the concepts of carbon neutral, and as Christian Samper has said it, nature positive. Because you can be carbon neutral and generate a lot of damage. So you have to be carbon neutral and nature positive. Colombia wants to lead that conversation and protect uh, more areas, and we di we're doing this in, in marine coastal areas. So we are using this example of making this call to the IMF because we need to be able to get more financing in order to accelerate this process. We cannot rely on donations and we cannot rely on the private sector as the only one that has to pay the bill in order to make this transformation. So Colombia is putting this conversation before the eyes of many, and we're going to be in Glasgow in the high coalition um, committee about energy transition. So all this will be put on the table with the leadership of our country. Uh, Senator Kane, uh, do you have any questions that you'd like to, to pose? Um, I, I would just, just to weigh in on your last point, Mr. President, about the notion that bonding and other agencies should look differently at investments that you might make on climate. I go back to my days, como alcalde de Richmond, you were living here in, in, uh, in the area when I was the mayor, and we did the same thing with our bonding agencies. We were a traditional central city dealing with urban poverty, and, and, um, and we had, um, you know, bumping up against our bond limits, according to Wall Street. But we went and said, the best thing for our city will be if we can invest and build new schools. And we would like to make that investment, even though it would put us above some of the bond limitations, because if we can attract more young families to want to move to our city, this will be the best thing for the long-term fiscal health of the country. And, and they looked at that plan and said, you know, you're right. You're going to be up above some of your bond limits. But that is the kind of investment that's the long-term investment that you need to make. So I think I hadn't heard this idea before. It makes perfect sense to me. And, um, you know, I hope a, a coalition of heads of state uh, making that argument to, together could, uh, you use the phrase, uh, the, the, the financial agencies can't look with pre-pandemic eyes at a post-pandemic reality. We're in a post-pandemic reality, and they need to be more creative in the, a plan of the kind that you mentioned. Hadn't, thought, hadn't heard of it, but to me, it, it makes a lot of sense. We have time for one more question. Cindy? Sure. Thanks. Um, I, I want to add something yes. on, on, what, on what Senator Kane did, has mentioned, and yes, I think that's, that's one step. The other step is also having debt relief based on climate action uh, objectives that are, that are met. And, and maybe something that has to be also in the, in the discussion is how can we build mechanisms in which we unify carbon markets around the world so that we can seal protected areas and the amount of carbon that is, that, is, uh, that is captured can also allow countries to, to have resources. 
So we're thinking on that uh, green financing, and I think this is as important as adaptation and as mitigation, Senator. Thank you for your comment. Great. Last question. Going back to the refugee situation, um, combating xenophobia um, in Colombia is a huge task. Um, the public opinion polls obviously are not favorable to this large presence, you know, of, of Venezuelans with so much need still, you know, in the Colombian population. But the government has launched these campaigns using media stars and, and uh, entertainers and musicians and whatever uh, to the campaign Colombia Sin Fronteras. At a time when most countries in Latin America are looking internally, how can there be regional action in other countries, including Peru, Ecuador, that are hosting large migrant populations to combat xenophobia and deal with this as a regional issue as opposed to country by country? Cynthia, Colombia has today the equivalent of 4% of our population in migrant communities. Ecuador has 4% of their population in migrant communities. Peru has 4% of their population in migrant communities. And maybe Chile will be almost the same. So this is something that is happening in, in the hemisphere. I have to say something. I thought it was going to be more complicated to be able to do the pedagogy of that decision. I have the president of Colombian Congress here within me, Juan Diego Gomez, and we had a full support in Congress. I mean, with maybe a few exceptions, people supported the idea of the TPS. Most of the governors supported the idea of the TPS. And most of the mayors, and when I mean most, it's, it's really more than 90% of the mayors supported the TPS. And I think that has a value. Now, can that last forever? That's the challenge we have to face because in nowadays of, uh, of fake news and, and uh, hatred uh, derived from uh, armies of bots and hashtags and, and uh, trends, you have to be very persuasive in telling the community that xenophobia needs to be rejected bluntly at the minute it happens. So the only way to prevent this is through the TPS. Because what people don't want to see is if, for example, any migrant this commits a, a crime and he is being released by the by the judges 24 hours, 48 hours, because they don't have the capacity to recognize whether it is the same person or not. Uh, the TPS allows that if somebody has a wrongdoing and it's part of the migration community, he'll get sanctioned or he'll be expelled. But also people that said that their, their jobs were taken away because they were paying them less. Today, when you play in the field, they, they no longer can use that sentiment to exacerbate hatred. So I think this is a matter of having policy, fraternity, technology, and common sense. This is the best way to prevent xenophobia. But obviously, Cynthia, I have to say this. This is not something that can last forever because as the dictatorship continues in Venezuela, we're going to see more migration. So that's why there has to be an end to the dictatorship. And this is not a matter of right or left or liberals and conservatives. No, this is a matter of, of human rights protection. What is happening in Venezuela is insane. It's absurd. And it's really to see suffering. And I think the international community should keep on having the pressure. And the only way out in the conversations that they're having in Mexico is to have the end of the dictatorship through rapid 
presidential elections with a very detailed supervision from the international community because otherwise the tragedy is going to be bigger and bigger over time. Mr. President, we began by saying that our mission here is uh, to close the gap between the world of learning and the world of public policy. You have given us a lot of learning. We have learned a great deal from you today. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate generosity with your time. Good luck to you again. We stand with you. Thank you, President. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much. It has been a great honor. You have been listening to America's 360, a podcast about the innumerable ties among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To learn more about our programs, please visit wilsoncenter.org. And please join us again next time for another episode of America's 360.